Hello and welcome to worship at the Lindsay United Methodist Church. On this second Sunday after Epiphany, we greet you with hope in the name of our risen Christ. Let us worship the Lord today. We hope that you find him here in this worship. We thank you for joining us today, whether you are streaming on Facebook, if you're watching, uh, if you're listening live on the radio, <clears throat> or in some way joining us today, we thank you for that. Uh, we have a few announcements to make. There's some birthdays in January we want to mention. Nathan Urban's birthday is on the 17th. And Frankie Minton, if you see Frankie Minton, remind her that she has a birthday on the 19th. Now, it's printed on this bulletin which one, but I'm not going to say that because I'm going to let her uh, make that announcement if she so chooses. So if you see Frankie, remind her that she has a birthday. Uh, Don Shelton's birthday is the 20th, and Tyler Keeler's birthday is the 22nd. Now, there was a Bible study schedule called Gather Round the Table. It was going to be led by Francis Bunch, and it has been postponed now until a later time, and you will hear more about that as we move along, and maybe she can reschedule that. So keep that in mind to join with us on a Gather Round the Table Bible study. So as we prepare our hearts for worship today, let us sing together, Gather Us In, in the Upper Room Hymnal. Here in this place new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space our fears and our dreamings brought near to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the blind and strong, Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away, but here in this place the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones. Please join me in the call to worship. We come to worship the one whom the Spirit of the Lord has anointed. The anointed one proclaims good news to the poor, binds the brokenhearted, proclaims liberty for the oppressed, releases the captives, and sets at liberty them that are bruised. We come to worship the one whom the Spirit of the Lord has anointed. The anointed one bestows the crown of peace, the oil of joy, and the garland of beauty instead of ashes of mourning and robes rended in grief and despair. He provides a mantle of praise in reproach of a spirit 
faint with despair. We come to worship the one whom the Spirit of the Lord has anointed to rebuild ancient city ruins, restore former devastations, and bind their wounds in the love that Shalom's healing may come. And let's sing a hymn called, I'm Gonna Sing When the Spirit Says Sing. It's number 333 in the hymnal. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm gonna pray when the Spirit says pray. I'm gonna pray when the Spirit says pray. I'm gonna sing great when the Spirit says pray. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm gonna moan when the Spirit says moan. I'm gonna moan when the Spirit says moan. I'm gonna moan when the Spirit says moan. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the Spirit says shout. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. Our affirmation this morning is the Apostles' Creed. Please join me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And now it's time for the children's moment with Miss Lacey. children belong welcomed as part of the worshiping throng water god's word bread and cup prayer and song this is where children belong how are you girls huh good does it feel good to be here mm-hmm well I have a question for you. Did you bring something valuable or special to you today? Special? Would you share that special thing with me? Mm -hmm. You would, but you'd probably rather not. It's okay. I know how that feels. Now, this ring, you see this, is one of my most prized possessions. It's very important to me, okay? Now, I don't know if it's worth much to somebody else, but I would never sell it because the money I would get wouldn't ever match up what it really means to me. It's my wedding ring. It's very important to me. So 
what did you bring that is important to you? What'd you get? You told me you got it for Christmas. <gasps> oh, I see lots of letters. And Daisy. <gasps> oh, does it read you that book? <gasps> but use that and see what, what you spell. <gasps> you push these. <gasps> you spell cat. You did so good. Do you have a special kitty at home? Uh, you have. Oh, no, I forgot to spell cow. And cow? What else you got? I'm sorry. See? It's K. O. W. Moo. No. Now hey, you just to do I have a story I want to tell you, and then you can show me that in just a minute, sister. What you got? What's that do? <laughs> you didn't want sister to share her slobbers? No, sometimes we share things that others aren't really wanting, don't we? Now, and Sadie has her guitar. Now, it plays music? That is so cool. Now, I have a story, and I want to share it with you, okay? Now, one day Jesus went to the city of Beth Bethany. That was the city where a man named Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead, that's where he lived. Lazarus lived with his two sisters, Mary and Martha. While Jesus was in Bethany, a dinner was given in his honor. Silly Sonny. Now, Lazarus was eating at the table with Jesus while Martha was serving the meal. So which one would you be if you were the one sitting with Jesus? That would be Mary. Or would you be running around serving the dinner? What do you think? Would you be sitting or serving? She'd be eating her dinner. I don't blame you, but you got to get, get it while the getting's good. Now, as she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, Mary was the one sitting there. Mary did something very unusual. She took a bottle of perfume, and she began to wash Jesus' feet. Ah, <gasps> stinky feet, and you're going to dump perfume on it? Mm-mm, you think? No. So she washed his feet, and then she used her hair to dry his feet. Do you think I'd use my hair to dry your feet? Mm-mm. I would if I really needed to. But the Bible tells us that the entire house was filled with the sweet smell of perfume. One of Jesus' disciples, whose name was Judas, was very upset. He thought he, she just wasted all that good perfume and she could have sold it for money instead. But he was only worried about money because he took stuff that wasn't his. Now, Jesus came to Mary's defense and answered Judas, and he told him to leave her alone, that she had kept this perfume for the day of her, his burial. And Jesus said that was because he knew that was only a few days before he would be crucified and buried. Now, I don't know if Mary knew that or not, but Mary wanted to give Jesus her very best and to show him how much she loved him. That perfume was the very best thing that Mary had to offer. Now, would you give Jesus your brand new book that reads to you? Mm-hmm. Sadie, would you give Jesus your brand new guitar if he asked? Or would you let him play it? I got a smile. I'm going to take that as yes. Now, Jesus has given us the most wonderful gift, and that was everlasting life. Not was, is. And it is free, but it was very costly for Jesus. It cost him his life, didn't it? Now, what can you do at home to show Jesus that you love him? You don't know? Could you pick up your toys in your room and show mom your best? Yeah, it doesn't happen very much in my house. But, but sometimes, and I'm really pleased when it happens. Now, could you share with your sister a French fry? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, maybe. What about help mom pick up all the dirty clothes? Put them in the laundry. Those are all little ways that don't take very long 
to show your best to mom, and by showing your best to mom, you're honoring God by doing that too. Now, let's bow our heads and pray, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that you had sent him to the cross for each and every one of us to have everlasting life. Lord, sometimes it's hard for us to want to give our best and to share what is most important to us. Lord, help us to remember that you need to be our focus and that is with our eyes on you that we'll never have a problem giving everything we need to straight to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, I have suckers. I know you already had one, but I'm going to give you one anyways. <laughs> Sonny's happy about those suckers. Why don't you take one and put it in mom's bag for Sonny later, okay? Thank you all for bringing your valuable things to share. The scripture lesson comes from chapter 61 of Isaiah, verses 1 through 6. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. May God add a blessing to the hearing and understanding of this holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen.
failure, God, and you have every victory. That was the magnificent, musical, Megan Dutton. Thank you, Megan, for sharing your gifts with us today. Absolutely delightful. And for those of you that could hear, little Sonny was doing her best to sing alto in the middle of it. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, what a blessing it is to hear the sounds of little children in your church again. The church comes alive when children are in the congregation and in our sanctuary. We pray for the day soon when we can hear those voices every Sunday. Here now in the reading of your word and the sharing of your word, may we, may we continue to bless and bring honor to you and may we experience your grace in all the measures that we need this day. Amen. Well, today I'm going to ask you to play a little bit of Alice in Wonderland with me and be willing to go down a few rabbit holes. We're going to, we're going to go visit a few rabbit holes for a bit, and then I promise we'll pop up later, and you'll know why we, we traveled where we traveled. So a little bit of theological discourse to get to the ending. Now, for many of us as United Methodists, We've taken Sunday school classes, especially new member classes, or maybe in confirmation classes, if you remember that far back, or maybe if you've ever gone on the three-day renewal retreat called the Walk to Emmaus. If you have, then maybe you know that the journey of faith, as we think about it as United Methodists, we have a very practical theology that our founder of our denomination, John Wesley, uses to describe God's grace working across our lives, across the whole of our lives, even working in our lives before we were born. As with virtually all other Christian denominations, there is an important emphasis on what Wesley would call justifying grace, justification. That's most in evidence during what we might describe as our saving moment, that period of time in which we come into a formal and a willful, eternal relationship with God through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That's when our sin is justified, made righteous through the saving grace of Christ. It's literally an accounting term. Our sins, past, present, and future, are no longer counted against us. The righteousness of Christ becomes our righteousness, a righteousness only attainable through God's grace through Jesus Christ. Now, for some denominations, as it was for the denomination of my youth, that is the most and in some ways the only important part of the faith journey that we get saved, whatever, whatever that means and however that's expressed in that denomination or that church's faith experience. Well, one of the distinctions, one of the distinctives of the Wesleyan grace theology is that while many Christians see being saved or justified at the sole point of the Christian journey, 
And that's because it gets us into heaven at the end of our lives. Wesley makes an additional distinction, but some of you grew up the way I did, that salvation is sold as a fire insurance policy, that it was our ticket out of hell and our ticket into heaven. Everybody needed to get saved so they'd get their ticket into heaven. That's not what I believe now, especially as a United Methodist, but that's for other sermons. But for United Methodists and other denominations rooted in Wesley's understanding of grace, salvation isn't a finish line as much as it is a new starting line. If Jesus does the work of salvation, of justifying grace, then what comes next is the work of the Holy Spirit in what we call sanctifying grace or sanctification. Justifying grace is the saving of our souls, but Sanctifying grace is the power that transforms our lives from people who had sin-sick souls into people whose lives now give witness, their whole lives give witness to the saving and the transforming power of God's grace. I was saved in a Baptist church, but I was transformed by God's grace through the United Methodist Church. Some of you have similar journeys of faith. You started in one place and ended up in the United Methodist Church. What the United Methodist Church taught me and introduced me to was that transformation or sanctification is a lifelong journey, a lifelong journey that starts after salvation. Ours is not just a walk with Christ, but ours is a walk to become more like Christ in thought and word and intent and deed. And that process never ends because there's always more in our humanity that needs to be transformed into a greater reflection of God's divinity. In justifying grace, we are given as a gift the righteousness of Christ. In sanctifying grace, we become more like Christ more Christ-like, and less like who we were when we were saved. Sanctification literally means to become more saint-like, to become more saintly, to become more holy as God is holy. Sanctification lives itself out in our denomination as other denominations in the process of disciple-making. Souls are saved through justification, through justifying grace, Believers are converted from non-believers through justification. Sanctifying grace also converts, but it converts and transforms believers into followers. Sanctifying grace converts and transforms followers into servants. Sanctifying grace converts and transforms servants into servant leaders. And then it continues its work, sanctifying grace converting and transforming servant leaders into fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples who now become those who are doing the work of converting believers themselves, converting believers to followers, to servants, to servant leaders, and then further on to fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, those who now take their place to create and transform the next generation of fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. A new convert, a new believer, can't do that. Sanctification, sanctifying grace, is the work through the church converting a believer along the way into a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. Sometimes the work of the church gets stuck at salvation, when the greater work of the church is not just about saving souls, but the greater work of the church is about transforming lives, transforming believers, new believers, new converts into fully devoted capable disciples of Jesus Christ who they themselves now are capable of making more disciples. In fact, I think that's actually the mark of a fully mature disciple, that until you are capable of making disciples, there's still work for you to do. But once you start contributing to the life of others through your own specific call and your graces and gifts, then you are helping others become those devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. We have to ask ourselves from time to time, where am I in that process? Our churches are full of people who spent 60 years stuck as new converts, 
and never entered into the transformative journey that converts them into true disciples. Others get stuck out of complacency or sometimes, more importantly, the failure of the church to actually create the process and to hold people accountable. Helping people begin to own their own journeys, become responsible for their own journeys of faith. Those, the church fails sometimes to help people really invite them into that inspired, transformative journey toward mature discipleship. When I look around the church at those who are serving in the church that are helping us provide our worship, I see mature disciples of Christ who are working in the ways that God has gifted them. We see young ones like Megan who are taking her gifts at an early age who are making a difference. Even our littlest ones, Sonny and Sophie and Sadie, who are adding their presence simply by being here today. They are beginning the journey. But there's always more work to do. The good news is, though, there's never condemnation in any of that. There may be the conviction of the Holy Spirit and then the power of the Holy Spirit to help us start anew from wherever we are on the journey, wherever we happen to be, to move further into that journey toward becoming fully devoted disciples. Now, all that is to say, as we've talked about justifying grace and we've talked about sanctifying grace, there's another form of grace, of God's grace that works in our lives, and it's what John Wesley called prevenient grace. Prevenient is an old-fashioned word. It's an old word we don't hardly use in any capacity other than as Methodists when we talk about grace. It's an old word that's sort of falling out of use. Prevenient simply means to come before, but to come before our awareness and our understanding. So prevenient grace for today is really the important part of the message, and it leads us to the story that I'll end with. Long before we've become saved through justifying grace or began the process of transforming our lives through sanctifying grace, in fact, long before we were born, long before, as the psalmist writes, before we were knit together in our mother's womb, God already knew your name. God's love was already in place in your future, thousands of years before your future, and in all of your moments of your future presence, calling your name working through the love of others, working through natural forms of grace offered through the beauty of all creation, drawing you, drawing us toward God's love, prevenient grace, reaching out to us before we can name it, before we have an awareness of it, before we know the source and where it's coming from, drawing us, wooing us in that old language of romance, God drawing us toward that love. Prevenient grace actually is God wooing us. It is literally God romancing us out of his love for us with the hope and the desire for us that before birth, that one day, one day, we would all one day discover that God is the source of that love. And then in a powerful, life-changing, soul-saving way that we would begin falling in love with God who's always been in love with us, who's never not been in love with us, that we would have that saving moment of falling in love with God. And then even more, beginning that journey where we choose, we get up every day and we choose every day to remain in love with God and to do more about falling in love with God and in love with God's creation and the people of God's, of God's creation. Prevenient grace is a promise that's made in our past that comes into its fullness in our future. Prevenient grace is the promise that's made in infant baptism where the church promises that we will raise the child, that the family will raise the child in God's love. And then in confirmation in the Methodist system when they're older, we take them through classes and then then older teenagers begin to choose for themselves that it will be not their mother's faith, not their dad's faith, not their grandparents' faith, but their own faith. The promise that was made in their infant baptism is confirmed as they become young adults. Prevenient grace is a promise made in the past that's fulfilled in the present. And we see that today is lived out in the scripture that was read. That was a scriptural passage spoken given to us out of Isaiah's life, the prophet, the great prophet of the Old Testament, writing those words, giving those words to us 500 years at least before the time of Christ. 
500 years later, when Christ comes out of the wilderness, as described in Luke, the very first time that Jesus stands up, and it's our first public record of Jesus speaking, of Jesus confirming his own sense of his identity to the world, the first thing that Jesus does is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, coming out of his wilderness time, is he, he goes to his home church there, And he asked for the scroll of Isaiah to be handed to him. And there in the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus the Jew unrolls the scroll of Isaiah to what we would call Isaiah 61, to the very passage that was read today. Reading those words not as a promise from the past, but as a promise being fulfilled. And he reads those, those same verses in what we call Luke 4, 18 and 19. And he says, today in your hearing, these words have been made true. The provenient grace of the words of our prophet long dead. 500 years later coming true. A promise from the past being made true in the present. That's prevenient grace. What prevenient grace does for us, as it did for me after my 20 years of wandering the world as an atheist, prevenient grace called me home, called me back to the home that God had made for me so long ago, called me to the home that we can make in God, not just a home for the hereafter, as I was taught in my youth, but more importantly, as a home in the here and now. Prevenient grace gets us to the porch of our home in God. It gets us all through that long, winding road, whatever it is for us, it gets us to the front porch of the home. Justifying grace is walking through that front door. That's our saving transformation. It's walking across the threshold from where we were into that life of faith with God. Prevenient grace gets us to the porch. Justifying grace is walking through the door. And then sanctifying grace is in exploring the richness of God's experiences that reveal themselves throughout the rooms there that God provides for us in our spiritual home that awaits us beyond the front door. And that's a spiritual home not to be uh, examined and explored once we get to heaven. It's a spiritual home that God makes for us now. Jesus uses those words, if you will abide in me, I will abide in you. The word abide is related to the word abode. If you make your home in me, if you make your abode in me, I will make my abode in you. Make your home in me, I will make my home in you. Prevenient grace is a prophecy. Sanctifying, sanctifying, sanctifying grace and justifying grace are the fulfillment of those prophecies as we see in Isaiah. So saving grace, justifying grace is the threshold, the front door between being lost and wandering and searching and seeking, trying to find our way home. Justification and justifying grace is a door between past and the present, between our past and the greater journey of our future. All of our faith journey after salvation, after crossing that threshold, is to explore those treasures of faith that God has in our futures. Treasures not to be gained for our own personal benefit, but treasures of grace to be shared with others that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven through our continuous acts of mercy and justice that continue the mercy and mission of of ministry of Jesus Christ. This is a lot to process in one sermon. We, these are deep, deep rabbit holes that we can explore. There's a lot about our historical, traditional, theological understanding of the faith journey that I've just shared. Books have been written about each of those understandings of the workings of God's grace, prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, God's calling grace, God's soul-saving grace, God's life-transforming grace. Years of sermons can be preached, and I've tried to pack it all here into one sermon. It's a full sermon. But all of that is just a setup for the end. It's a critical setup for the important point of today's sermon called, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. That hymn that we will sing after we get to the end of this long sermon today comes from a hymn that many of us know. You can't even read the words, blessed be the ties that bind, without singing 
the, the song that goes with it. That hymn was written by Reverend John Fawcett. He was a British-born Baptist preacher and theologian and hymn writer. Early in his career, he was a young preacher. His first early in his career, a young preacher in a tiny village in a barren town in the barren cold of north-central England. It was the geographical center of nowhere in England at that time. No salary, no parsonage. He lived with church families, and they moved him from family to family to family every few weeks. He and his wife and his four kids. That's calling, and that's commitment. Dirt poor, dirt broke, sharing what they had for seven years. One day in 1772, after seven years of pastoring there in Yorkshire, the 33-year-old Fawcett gets the call to a church in London, a big church in London with a salary and a house and all that London would provide. It seemed a dream come true, moving to London where his standard of living would vastly improve. And agonizing over the offer, he finally said yes. So they packed up. They climbed into a wagon, not a, a, a wagon with four wheels and an engine, but a wagon pulled by a horse. Waved goodbye to the many people that had gathered many miles to say goodbye. And it says, history says, the scene was so wrenching that Fawcett realized he couldn't leave. They expressed so much love for him and gratitude for having lived with them and served among them that he got down out of the wagon and packed, and they stayed there in Yorkshire for 43 more years. Out of that experience, he wrote the most famous of his 160 hymns, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. It was written as a hymn of parting. All of its words, we'll see those words in a bit, are words of blessing our time together as we now part. It would have been a beautifully appropriate hymn for this church to have sung to Pastor Jackie three weeks ago at her last sermon here. It's a beloved hymn that's sometimes heard and sung at funerals and memorial services as blessed words of parting. But blessed be the ties that bind. It's so important to us. It's been so part of our Christian experience and practice that the blessing is used as much now as a blessing of the present and the future as much as it is a blessing of the past. I use these words in my own day-to-day ministry at least once a week when I see somebody on Facebook that's celebrating their anniversary. And my response to them is exactly the same every time. Blessed be the ties that bind you in love with God and with each other. A blessing that speaks to their past. It's a blessing into the presence, but it's a blessing that brings a promise for continued blessings into their future. And there are some of you that will one day read those words from me on your Facebook page when you celebrate your day of your anniversary. Blessed be the ties that bind you in love with God and with each other. That blessing that recognizes the past but speaks into the present while making a promise for the future. Sounds a lot like the way that I was talking about God's acts of grace in our lives. Particularly and peculiarly the way that God's prevenient grace works in our past to get us to a future day. So we've been down the rabbit holes now. We've been theological Alice's in Wonderland, and now we pop up. We pop up to the most important point of my message today. What in the heck (laughs) does blessed be the ties that bind have anything to do with the here and now at Lindsay United Methodist Church? I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. Today is a show-and-tell sermon which is paradoxical as I preach to an empty sanctuary, preach to people who can only hear the sermon on the radio and can't possibly see what I'm about to show and share in my show-and-tell moment. 
as we are beginning to live into the beginnings of our ministry together, in a set of circumstances that none of us could predict nor would prefer, God was already busy more than 20 years ago in a mysterious work of prevenient grace that is now revisiting us 20 years later in our sudden integration into each other's present, preparing us for our most immediate future. 21 years ago, I was hired away from my 26-year healthcare career into my first ministry position, employed as a planned giving officer for the Oklahoma United Methodist Foundation. I have two undergraduate degrees in biology. I can't balance a checkbook, and God called me into finance ministry. I still got questions about that. But the foundation just happens to hold two investment accounts for the benefit of Lindsay United Methodist Church. One account was established by the church in 1999 for the benefit of the church, named the D and the Riley, the Ollie Riley Fund, the D and Ollie Riley Fund. The other is the James L. Charles Endowment Fund, established for the benefit of the Lindsay United Methodist Church by James and Mary Harrison in 1993. Because of the forward-thinking generosity of folks who are no longer among us, there is an annual, an important annual financial benefit continuing each year in our present for Lindsay United Methodist Church, a benefit that will likely continue into years to come for the benefit of Lindsay United Methodist Church. A couple of times in 2001 and 2002, working for the foundation, I visited James and Mary Harrison at their clothing store, which was just around the corner from the church on Main Street. For me, new to the ministry, early in the candidacy process, just starting seminary, I knew nothing, little about the Methodist church then. Just got my first Bible at 39 just a few years before. There was so much I didn't understand and didn't know. But for me, as this young guy starting out 21 years ago, as a young middle-aged guy starting out 21 years ago, James and Mary Harrison were the face of the Lindsay United Methodist Church for me. They were the face of the church's hospitality and its generosity and its kindness. Those amazing gifts of generosity and hospitality that benefited the church and the community benefited me. They always welcomed me into their store as a friend, never as a stranger. 2001, 2002, as a planning giving also foundation, I call, that's what I did. I called on churches. I called on donors throughout western Oklahoma. Everything west of I-35, the western districts of Oklahoma, were my offices away from offices. And that's everything from, from here to all the way out to Boy City. Those were churches where I preached and taught, helped set up endowments and wills and trusts. But here in Lindsay, here in Lindsay, I continued the practice of Mr. Jerry Bernardi. Mr. Bernardi, Jerry Bernardi, who was a stranger, took me to lunch one day, became a dear friend, was who I replaced at the foundation. Jerry Bernardi was a gentleman of honor and integrity. He personally trained me as his replacement at the foundation before he retired. I owe him a lot. Every time that Jerry had visited with the Harrisons after they established their endowment for the benefit of the church, every time, and when I say every time, I mean every time, every time that Jerry called on the Harrisons at their clothing store, Jerry Bernardi never walked out of the store without having bought a necktie from James and Mary Harrison, whether he needed a necktie or not. It was Jerry's way, his small way of saying thank you for their generous support of the Lindsay United Methodist Church through the Oklahoma United Methodist Foundation. 
Jerry told me of his practice with the Harrisons on that day that we drove down from Oklahoma City to Lindsay for him to introduce me to the Harrisons here in Lindsay. The very first time I ever went into the store to meet the Harrisons, I did exactly as Jerry did. I walked out with a necktie that I had bought from James and Mary Harrison. And each and every time that I visited the Harrisons during 2001 and 2002, I bought a necktie from James and Mary Harrison from their store, whether I needed a new necktie or not. Twenty years later, I still have at least one tie that I bought 20 years ago from James and Mary Harrison, having no idea that 20 years later I would be standing in their church in their pulpit, preaching a sermon as pastor at Lindsay United Methodist Church. A promise from the past living itself out in the present. So, all of this is to say, blessed be the neckties that bind us in love with God and with each other. Now, isn't that a magnificent, mysterious example of God's prevenient grace? God's grace, a promise made in the past to be revealed as a promise kept in the future. Well, guess what? Guess what? God is still in the business of keeping promises made in years past. He made a promise in this community a hundred years ago that there was going to be a Methodist church in Lindsay, Oklahoma. That promise is still coming true. Well, guess what? God's still in the promise of making promises now in our present that will be promises kept in the future, which is why we have to continue the work of Lindsay United Methodist Church now, no matter what else is going on. Our work together in our new unexpected season together is to remain obedient and trustful to God. In that other great hymn, Trust and Obey for There's No Other Way, you will hear that a lot from me during the time that I preach. We will go back to that over and over again. Our faithful mission and ministry together is to work together with being obedient and trustful working together to ensure that past promises come true. But our more important work together is to do just what James and Mary Harrison did, which is to keep helping God make promises in the present of the Lindsay United Methodist Church, all of its presence, promises in all of its presence that would become promises kept long into the future. Even, even if, like James and Mary Harrison, these are promises being kept in the future that they're no longer a part of except through their promises that were made and their promises that are still being kept to love and honor and provide for a church that they loved, honor, and provided for in their lifetime. I don't know all the details of what God is doing now. None of us do. We will discern that together. But what I do know is that God has called us together, that God has put us together. And He's put us together in a time and place that was started and initiated at least 20 years ago and longer before that, before any of us had any idea that today would come. What else I know is this. My spirit is coming alive again in this church and through this church. After a long time away, not knowing if I was going to be back in the church, this church is bringing me back to life, even as a part as we are. I feel myself, this valley of the dry bones I have been in for a long time, I feel myself coming to life in this church. I'm delighted to be here. I don't understand how we got here. I'm delighted to be here. I'm excited to see what God is unfolding for all of us. So as you, as a church, in your own way, continue to sing in blessed sorrow to Pastor Jackie as her past season with you has ended, as we sing to her, blessed be the ties that bind you here. Let us also... Let us also sing out in full hope of our future together, 
in this new season of mission and ministry here at Purcell United Methodist Church, saying those same words. May we sing them out not as sorrow and parting. Let us sing them out as a promise and as hope. Blessed be the ties that bind us together in love with each other and in love with God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Somewhere years ago, probably most Sundays, money was put in offering place like this by people like James and Mary Harrison and people that had long died before they ever got here filled offering plates like this one with money and gifts, tithes and offerings that allowed the work and the mission and ministry of the church to go through. And people like the Harrisons and like lots of people across Oklahoma and across the, the, the United States, across the world, put promises into the present that continue to provide for the future of the church. So we give thanks for those promises that were made by people like the Harrisons and others. And we continue to give thanks for all of you who are continuing in all of your own way to give into our present to ensure that we have a very active and vital future here at Lindsay United Methodist Church. And we should sing about that. Ed? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye Ed, what song are we going to end on today? I think we're going to sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Why don't we stand up, all of us that are out there? Why don't we all stand up and sing, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart. And we don't hope to meet again. We know we will meet again. The saints that go before us, the James and the Mary Harrisons, and all of the saints that have gone before us, we will gather again in their presence one day. And that's more about a hope. That's a promise. We send you now with a benediction and a blessing as we will each and every week, using words much like this each and every week, because it's not just a benediction, it's a blessing, it's a promise in our present to be lived out in our future. We serve ascending God, and we now send you forth into your week to be that living presence of hope 
We send you forth to lead with grace, to walk with spiritual integrity, to serve with humility, so that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father, the blessed and glorious Father in heaven, the name of the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 church is not a steeple the church is not a resting place the church is a people i am the church you are the church we are the church together all who follow jesus all around the world yes we're the church together we're many kinds of people with many kinds of faces, all colors and all ages, too, from all times and places. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Sometimes the church is marching, sometimes it's bravely burning, sometimes it's riding, sometimes hiding, always it's learning. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church too.